Dr. Ryan Stanton here with ASEP Frontline, starting off day three of ASEP 16 in Las Vegas, Nevada. Starting off today with Dr. Jay Baruch, Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine, Alpert Medical School at Brown University, where he serves as the Director of the Medical Humanities and Bioethics Scholarly Concentration, so a lot of humanities involved, and also an author, and we'll get into that as well. So, uh, Dr. Baruch, give us some background um, how you got interested in this and really the um, um, some of the focus and goals of medical humanities. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's, it's really great to be here. Um, ASAP, it's fantastic what you're doing here. Um, so I came into the world of medical humanities uh, through my sort of creative activities as a, as a, as a, as a writer, as mo largely as a fiction writer. And that was because it became clear to me, um, not too far in, out of my residency, that despite all the technical skills and the knowledge that I um, received going through a very, very fine residency at Christiana, was that um, a lot of the challenges that I was facing really had to do with, uh, with story. Mm -hmm. um, getting the patient's story, the difficulties, challenges of caring for patients who um, are sort of fraught with uncertainty. And I found over time that I was using my creative writing skills more and more as bedside clinical skills. And so that sort of was my entryway into this world of medical, uh, the world of medical humanities, not really from a scholarly pursuit, though I ended up over time, I think, melding into a little bit of both. Um, this, why I think medical humanities is absolutely essential to emergency medicine is because it sort of, it helps address some real critical dimensions of emergency medicine practice that we really don't address as um, directly and discreetly in emergency medicine training programs. Mm -hmm. um, and in sort of professional development and CME programs. Uh, those issues are vast. They can be uh, narrative-based related to how we understand the stories that patients tell us. Um, and to be a little bit more specific about that is we think about the patient's story, like they come to us with this story as if it's this perfect little nugget of knowledge and all we have to do is just go get it, right? But you know, we don't always recognize the fact that uh, that the stories sometimes are so you know, difficult to sort of wrap our hands around. They're sort of nonlinear. They can be told indirectly. There there are gaps. I think there's a fair number of plot twists as well in many of them. And, and, plot, and, and plot twists. And um, and the key thing is that the silences that we oftentimes face, um, sometimes can be very frustrating, or we ignore them. And oftentimes, as the, the actor and the playwright, Anna Devere Smith, once said, you know, we can learn, you know, we can learn so much about someone in the very moment that language fails them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and why this is important, and why I think this is absolutely essential, is that when I think about my role as an emergency physician, I mean, I am first and foremost a professional story listener, right? We go to work, we listen to 25, 30, 40 stories a shift, and all the medical knowledge, all the procedural skills that we have are really what we do in response to that. But unless we get the story right, you know, it doesn't make a difference how much knowledge we have in our brains, right? And if, we, um, if, if we're not aiming at the right target, mm -hmm. it doesn't make a difference if we have the latest bow and arrow. Um, and this has, you know, and this has great bearing. I mean, it has bearing as um, in, in regards to patient communication. It has bearing as far as, um, uh, you know, medical, you know, a, sort of a, a medical legal um, consequences sort of like lots of times the biggest challenge is the fact that we didn't get this, the story right, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, um, and also, you know, addressing the reductionist focus in medicine, which is we're oftentimes very focused on having the answer, 
And I think the humanities also allow, gives you comfort and gives you this sort of a skill set, hopefully, to sort of learn how to ask the right questions and to be comfortable not knowing and not to ask questions of patients with a certain end in mind rather than to be open to the possibilities. And, and I will tell you this when I talk about this, people then say, but, but we only have that much time in emergency medicine, right? We're not, like, we don't have an hour to sit down mm -hmm. with our patients and do this. But, but, I, but I feel that because we have such a little time is the reason why we have to be expert at this. You know, we can do better. Like, is it going to be perfect? I don't know. I mean, I'm, I think I'm always in the act of becoming, trying to become better, become more compassionate, becoming nicer or whatever. I'm always a work in progress. I think we all are. But I think we, we, the nature of what we do and the stakes are so high and the human dimensions of what we do um, really dictate that we sort of take advantage of all these other potential skills and ways of looking at our work. Um, and these are low technology skills. These don't cost much, right? You don't have anything. Um, and that's, I think, where the medical humanities can, can fit in. It also helps us become a little bit more open-minded about possibilities. And it helps us sort of think about the world and the patient's experiences from different perspectives, alter um, alternative perspectives. And, and I don't want to go to the fact that it can be healing for us, but I do feel there's probably some sense of being able to connect and sort of be able to engage with our patients, perhaps in a more human level, and to be able to reflect upon that, that um, it probably is somewhat uh, enduring and, and perhaps um, a source of solace for, for, for us and, and what we do, because I think we're challenged all the time. We don't always stop it and recognize that. Interestingly, I feel like so many of the talks, and I've given two here, that you know, medical school and residency teach us this science, but then the first 10, 15 years or longer of our practice is actually filling in the rest of the toolbox with the social aspect and the other aspects outside the science. We're taught to be scientists, and then we're like, well, really, what is just as important as everything else that surrounds that aspect of the care process? That's exactly right. You know, and this, and this is not to diminish the, like, let's face it, you know, we live in a complicated world. You know, there's a lot of technology, a lot of knowledge that's out there, mm -hmm. right? And, and that does put a lot of pressure on, on educators and us as learners. You know, I've been out over 20 years. I still consider myself a learner, right? So the world is changing. Um, but it doesn't replace the fact that there's a different set of sort of skills that actually, it's not, once you have that knowledge and you have those skills, at the essence, at the very core of, of, of the enterprise of caring for patients is actually caring for other human beings. And they are complex, you know, and there's so much, the ambient reality is uncertainty um, in what we do. And I think the humanity sort of helps take those other skills that we have, that we've worked so hard to cultivate that our, that our mentors and our, and our um, you know, the, our teachers have, have helped us master, well, um, to learn how to apply that as a different type of knowledge um, and a different skill set. So I think it's both. I mean, both are equally important. And, uh, and, I, and I think I applied, I really applaud ASAP the fact that we have this section in medical humanities um, because when I talk to colleagues in the medical humanities world that we actually have a section mm -hmm. that actually focuses on medical humanities. There's a sense of like jaw dropping, like emergency medicine, and you know, and I feel like a little bit of chest pumping. You know, it's like it's really proud of the fact that our organization has a section that focuses on medical humanities. It's one of those things, though, that if 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 it, if medicine went purely by the science, you wouldn't need us there. You could now just have a computer where you plug in the data, and you come down via your algorithm. It's actually everything else that actually makes us so important, the differences in care based on culture, background, life experiences, uh, the way you communicate, the way we receive. And that was yesterday in our empathy lecture talking about one of the most important things you can do is understand how you communicate, which most of us as scientists fall in a certain two categories. And everybody else is everything, can be in everything. So understanding how you communicate, how they communicate, so you can make sure that 
it's not a Mac communicating with Windows type situation where you've got great data on both sides, but neither can communicate with each other. And so being able to understand who you are, understanding and being open to the where they're coming from, so you can actually get the information. In medicine, honestly, and this is what we talked about yesterday, you know, doctor means teacher. It doesn't mean receiver, pontificate, who, whatever it means. It means teacher. And a lot of our patients, if we left well enough alone, the medical process would take care of itself, whether it's an ankle sprain, whether it's a cold, whether whatever it is. I mean, sure, there's stuff we have to intervene on. But a lot of what we do is about giving them information and answers. And so it's our ability to receive, process, and then communicate back with them a very complex set of things that is medicine. And I think that's why this is so important, because really, it is the root of medicine. I mean, we think it's the prescriptions and the technology and all this other stuff, and it is amazing. But really, the root of medicine and the, and the public need and the social need is what we provide as the professional, as the physician, as the expert in the topics. And being able to be open up to the possibilities of, like, what does the patient actually need what yes. not what you think the they subplot. need not what you think they need mm-hmm. but what, they, what do they think they need cuz i mean think about what we do and the the public's you know fascination with emergency medicine is often time around the mythology of you know the blood and mayhem and responding and codes and the craziness and that's what sort of gets people attention but really the essence you know the essence of what we do is but that is is more difficult than that mm-hmm. like that stuff is life-saving and it's the core of what uh, of, of emergency medicine and we love saving lives right we love being on the on that precipice and saving lives um, but that part oftentimes is, is algorithmic to a point right we sort of know the responses how we're supposed to react but when you, when they come in and there's no map you know when they might when when they when we think they might they want an answer, but really what they want is a reassurance, or they want mm-hmm. a bed, or, um, or they or, want a or meal. Getting, uncovering their fear, or what really why they're there. A family member that died from this recently. I mean, we it, may think it's like complete bunk, like why are you here? But then really there's a true fear there that we have to answer. There's a backstory. Yes. Right? I mean, and that's why I oftentimes tell you know, students and residents that when you're confused, when you're thinking about like, oh God, why, why is this person here? The most important thing, even when you're, when you're writing, when you're writing a story and you're stuck, you know, you don't often, you don't really think about plot. You think about character. You must take a step back or two and think, okay, how did I get to this place? Mm-hmm. Who is this person? You know, and, you know, and, and this idea of, of understanding patient stories is something that you do together because oftentimes the patient stories can are really like first drafts. Mm-hmm. Right? They're coming in and they tell you something, but it's not like this this perfect thing. Like they're trying to oftentimes patients are trying to understand why they're here and being able to communicate that. Um, and if we can be sensitive to that um, and know that we are not rushed and that we're going to sit here and we're going to listen to what you have to say, you know. Not for an hour, but we can sit down and listen and ask interesting questions and ask like the right questions and be skilled at and develop that curiosity um, to say, listen, I care about you enough to listen to you and mm-hmm. try to ask you questions that perhaps you have not been asked before, that perhaps are not medically, directly medically related, but, but are really profoundly linked to why you're here. That the thought- community, the emergency department has a community, right? That thought of walking in the room and saying, what does my patient need from me today? Right. And it's not always a prescription. Right. There's a lot more to it. Now, you are, um, speaking of writing, you are well accustomed to writing yourself. You've got um, several publications out there, What's Left Out, 14 Stories, Doctors, Patients, and Other Strangers. Give us a little background on your history of, of writing, and I assume that was... You were doing that well before medicine, and it's kind of like what I'm doing here, where I start off in media first, then medicine, and then we all come back around and start putting them together. Well, I'm thinking about going into media, right? You can. You <laughs> no, can. Not, not, with my, not with my voice. You're going to have to downsize, um, though. Um, I'm very downsized. Yeah. I, yeah, I loved, you know, I, I am one of those people who was an English major in college and went to 
you know, thought I was going to be an English professor mm-hmm. and loved writing. And, and, and oftentimes, you know, uh, I, I was fascinated with medicine, but it wasn't something that was sort of within my sort of realm of confidence that I can get into medical school. Um, and I, when I look now back on what I'm doing, you know, being able to sort of actually move my way into writing, which was, you know, a long time in coming in medical school, I took a year off and tried to study writing and, mm-hmm. and took a little bit of a, a yeoman's approach to it, which was just sort of writing and trying to get some mentors and writing and writing and writing. And, uh, and I never expected to sort of write about, have my stories be related somewhat to medicine. Um, I tried to avoid that a little bit at first, and it was the wrong thing to do because there's so, there's, it's, there's so much that's rich about the experience of, of just this world that we're in, not just from the perspective of physicians, but you know, patients and families and caregivers and, and just the, the communities that we're in. And you know, what I've become fascinated now is that you know, the healthcare system seems so surreal. Right? It seems so mm-hmm. crazy in some ways. And you know, in, my, in my last book, I was trying to sort of capture that tone of sort of, you know what, I'm, it's so strange, and the only way I can try to reflect sort of the illogical ways <laughs> and the thought patterns that are going on about how medicines we practice um, is to go stranger. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's, it's, been, it's been a really fantastic way for me to really think deeply and to spend time uh, 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 with my own emotions and, uh, and to work through some, just work through some, some through characters, work through these issues um, and work through uh, the frustrations and the joys, um, but, but really the complexity of what it's like to be someone, whoever that someone is, uh, uh, either who's ill or caregiving or is taking care, uh, is a caregiver, and to inhabit those people. As, and it allows you then to sort of look differently upon yourself. You discover, mm-hmm. you discover aspects of yourself that perhaps I might not have discovered otherwise. And sometimes it's a way to work your, those dark thoughts off on the page and you know, shuck it off on characters. And oh, Tolstoy did that, by the way. I'm not Tolstoy. <laughs> All right. So with Dr. Uh, Jay Baruch, other than what we mentioned prior in the intro, um, he serves now as the director at large of the American Society for Bioethics and Human, uh, Humanities and the Medical Humanities Section Chair right here at the American College of Emergency Physicians, uh, recently recognized with the Arnold P. Gold Foundation Humanism in Medicine Award from the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine. And your section recently got a grant. So tell us about that and what our plans are and what we can expect from a college. Yeah, we're really excited about this. I mean, we're honored that the, that the college um, uh, gave, us, gave us this seed money to, um, for this grant. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, one of my colleagues actually at Brown, Dina Himmelfarb, is doing a lot of the heavy lifting with this. But um, it's, it's really going to be a, a, pro, uh, a project uh, with so many great people involved in the, the section. And what it involves is actually, it's a, it's a four module syllabus that we're, that we're piloting. And it's called Humanities at the Bedside. And we're trying to provide a way to examine some of these issues that don't normally get examined, um, but provide a lens for either residency programs or groups to, um, to start discussions. So we're breaking it up into, into four modules mm-hmm. and we kept them sort of metaphorically resonant. You know, so there are um, en- endings, uh, boundaries, connections, and humor. And you can interpret that. We're gonna have a sort of a, uh, scaffolding idea of like how to interpret these, different ways of interpreting, though we hope people will interpret them differently with um, some uh, with either readings or clips or examples for people to use mm-hmm. um, with guiding questions. And, and we're hoping that it's going to serve as a, a resource or a starting resource for section members to be able to 
bring people together, have these discussions, talk about some of the things that we're talking about, um, and and hopefully build on it themselves. We hope we hope it's going to be successful. It'll be on the the ASAP website, um, and it's going to be you know it'll be available to all section members, and uh, we hope to have it launched by next ASAP, um, and it should be. We it, we're we're we're, we're, we're well along, we're, we're feeling very excited about this, and um, and we're hoping we're able to build on it and make it more than just four modules. Um, but a lot of it is going to depend upon like how it's used, the feedback that we receive, mm-hmm. and and I'll also just mention if you let me remind that you know we're we're a very inclusive bunch. So if there are people out there who want to be involved, um, they should contact contact us. Um, we we welcome people with various different experiences, life experiences. You don't have to be a humanities person. You can be just a person who wants to be involved, and we want you. Fantastic. And I appreciate your time. Give us ways that folks can contact you, a website, email, Twitter. Uh, where where can we, you be accessed if folks have questions about the section or about the projects? So I'm on Twitter at uh, jbaruchmd. Uh, I am. I have a, if they can also find my website, which is mm-hmm. jbaruch.com, or they can um, contact me at my email, which is j j y underscore baruch b a r u c h at brown dot edu. Fantastic. And so those but find uh, me. <laughs> the, the baruch is b a r u c h. So either at jbaruchmd, uh, the jbaruch.com. Uh, or via the email, fantastic ways. I think there's some great questions um, there, especially if you came to uh, my talks. And, uh, you know, it, it's clear that uh, we think a lot on the same line of the the increased breadth of medicine that you need to understand that's outside of most textbooks um, to really provide the best care that you can provide to your patients. As for me, you can contact me at Everyday Med on Twitter, as well as the ASAP Frontline Facebook page. We invite you to get on there, like the page, so you know when we're releasing new content and what's going on with ASAP Frontline. We will be releasing new podcasts once a week uh, from this point forward, so expect every Monday to have a new delivery from ASAP Frontline. You can also catch us. Um, you can contact me at my email, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. And until next time, thank you for joining us for ASAP Frontline. <laughs>